Oh my gosh, I know the show tonight is sight, but I think I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. What? Uh, thank you for being here tonight, Santa. <laughs> been a busy weekend for you. I'm really tired. Yeah, I bet you are really tired. It's a long way from the North Pole. <laughs> yes. Welcome, everyone. So great to see you. I am your host, Jody Eichelberger, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Story Story Night's Making Sense of... Excuse me. Woo! Making Sense of It All. Tonight's theme is sight. Um... How many people are here because you're scheduled for a Southwest airline flight? <laughs> I know at least one of you is, because <laughs> I've already heard that story. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here regardless of whether you're supposed to be or not. Uh, tonight, because our theme is sight, we've added something that's recommended for making things more accessible, and that is some audio description when someone comes to the microphone, and if you're going to come and slam, you can feel free to do this too. It's just introducing yourself and then adding a little bit of description. Uh, so, for instance, hello again, I'm Jody Eichelberger. I'm, oh, thank you. I now have medium short gray hair. I am, I lost about five pounds of weight in one second. Uh, that's not part of audio description. That, I'm blowing it. I'm being a bad example. Let's, okay. Middle-aged, uh, brown eyes. I'm wearing a gray suit with kind of a purple-blue pocket handkerchief. Oh, but that's, thank you. Thank you. But that's editorializing. She said, she said handsome, which I agree, but, <laughs> but you're not supposed to editorialize in your description. Plus, it should be about 10% as long as what I just did. All right, so that's our, hey, um, Irreverent Tones, how, how would you audio describe yourselves? Uh, oh, you're gonna have to step up to a mic. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, it's, it's for all of us. Just a second, I've got, I've got a little preparation. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, visually, uh, um, we, we're, as I said, you know, we're really trying to write from a more visual perspective, and so, you know, just kind of, I know that a lot of writers work in a lot of different ways and a lot of different mediums, but in this one, we're working very visually. We like to, we like to see things, write about those things that we're seeing and observing. And you know, the, the, the key to your storytelling is obviously, kind of almost begins here in this window uh, into whatever soul, brain, whatever, <laughs> frontal lobe, whatever that is. But that's where it all begins for me as a, as a writer, as a lyricist. It all begins right here. So Right with the eyes right with and the, the sight. Eyes. Very cool. Yeah, people, I mean, I've, people say, write what you know. I'm like, that's cool for people who know stuff. <laughs> right? I don't know anything, so, so I have to kind of write what I see. So. He writes what he sees. All right. And what he also said is that he's wearing a brown hat and a green sweater. <laughs> Blue jeans and has a handkerchief tied around his neck, and he's I, wearing I, black glasses. I, I, I avoid mirrors, so I. He avoids thank mirrors. You, thank you for that. <laughs> All right. I also want to begin by thanking our season sponsor, the Shandro Group. Thank you for your support. Anyone here from the Shandro Group tonight? Well, then we don't need to clap. All right. <laughs> no, we do. We do. We clap. There we go. I also want to thank our story subscribers. Who's a story subscriber here tonight? There they are with their proud hands. All right. <laughs> and uh, tonight, you see behind me this end of year, this is our end of year $5,000 match challenge. And it's grown since we turned it on, which is great. So some of these, uh, well, no, all of these have happened tonight. One of them happened two minutes ago. Anthony Marker, two minutes ago, his $50 pledge is giving $100 to Story Story Night until we reach $5,000. Thank you for that. Uh, John Klingle, Anna Carlson, me Hammerstedt, and Doug Shea, all of this within the last 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And the way that they did that is they texted SSN 2022 to 44321. And it is a very generous anonymous donor who put up that $5,000 match for our end of year campaign. Listen, we did terrible on Giving Tuesday, so uh, we had to regroup. <laughs> we, did, we put no energy into it at all. That might have had something to do with it. 
but let me tell you what I do love is end of year gifts. <laughs> okay. So who is, so we saw our story subscribers, but who is here for the first time? Who's never been to a story story night show before? Oh my goodness. Wow, that's super cool. All right, so let me tell you about the structure of the show. We have some speakers that we have already planned to have tonight. We call them our featureds, and we meet with them, they rehearse together, they do a peer review, they get to give comments, they've worked on their stories. And then unlike most other story shows in the nation, we do this other really crazy thing where we match those people who have actually rehearsed and thought about what they're going to say with random people from the audience who may have put no thought into it whatsoever. And some of them have put thought into it. And the way you can participate in that is visiting Ben and Susan right over here at the Story Story booth. And you'd write your name on a ticket, drop it in that little white box thing. And throughout the show, we will draw a, um, a name. And you can tell us your five minute story on site. Uh, my eyes for this show were much bigger than the stomach of the show, meaning that we have so much cool stuff for the show tonight that I just really need to get right into it. So we have a special family with us tonight that is going to bring us into this idea of sight. I want to welcome the Holson family, at least two of the members up on stage, Rob and Maxwell Holson. <laughs> Hey guys. All right, we'll start with Rob since the microphone is tall and then we can move it down a little lower. Um, so, Maxwell here is your son. Right. <laughs> your middle son, right? You have three? Yes. yes, three sons. All right, but you learned at some point that there's something special about the way Maxwell sees and what is that and how did you learn about it? Well, um, one morning, as uh, parents of boys would probably understand, uh, it started with a fight <clears throat> uh, between the boys. And uh, they were fighting over the color of a backpack of one of my sons. Jude, would you mind holding up that backpack so everybody can see it real quick? The argument, everybody looking at this, probably most of you, although in a room this size, statistically, some of you will not be able to recognize the color properly. But that is, uh, to my eyes, I see a neon green backpack. That was kind of the color. There, well, there was this discussion, well, discussion. <laughs> there was this uh, heated discussion about the uh, color being yellow yellow or green. And so they start fighting about what color is it and all this. And I said, well, hey, look, it's yellow. It just has a little bit of green in it. It's kind of maybe chartreuse, you know? And oh, no, Max and, and Jude, the, the other one over here who held it up, oh, it was, it was absolutely, you know, yellow. It had no green in it. None at all. Of course not. So I thought to myself uh, that maybe we should take a colorblind test. And so there was a, there was a, a website that had a test that you could take and so I had them each take this test and it was really weird because if you've ever done a colorblind test anybody done any of these sorts of tests before some of you have yeah so the uh, it puts a number or a letter in a, in a series of bubbles with different colors on it and so I'm staring right at the number five and I say Maxwell what do you see and he goes nothing and I go whoa <laughs> That's pretty crazy. So after we went through all of this, we found out that he has a particular kind of color blindness, and so does Jude, called protan color blindness, and it's a specific type. And so that was at least how it started, that I discovered that they were seeing the world differently than I was seeing the world. So my favorite color is purple, and I know that that might have an impact on their ability to even see it at all. Mm. So that's where it at least started for us. We discovered that they were, yeah, they had color blindness, so. So you found a way around this a, when, a year ago or a year yeah. and a half ago? Year and a half ago, yeah. This uh, handy dandy website, this company makes these glasses. Maybe you've seen these videos on uh, YouTube or TikTok or whatever. And it's like uh, people seeing different colors for the first time. Anybody seen a video like that as well? They're, oh, they're, they just, they're moving. I, I found that they were very moving and touching for somebody to see a color they've never seen for the very first time. And so uh, we went ahead and got a pair of these glasses, and uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience. And I'll let Max will probably tell his side of it. But we did find that these glasses can help in certain situations. How's that? Yes. Good. Good. All right. All right. Do you want to pull them 
now. So, uh, yeah, show us these glasses that you got on this summer day. There they are. Yes, yeah, so these are in chroma color blend glasses. Um, and they, of course, they're color blend glasses, so they help you see colors. And, and what did you think when that you were at the park and your dad's like, hey, we got a gift for you. And you open up and you open a pair of glasses. What, what were you thinking? Well, I was um, feeling like a crazy surge of gratefulness. I was like, this will change my life forever. And it oh, really Oh, so you did. knew what they were already. You knew what they were even before you put them on? Yes. Oh, wow. And you just hoped that it was going to unlock something. And it did, huh? Yes. So what were the first things you noticed when you put those on? Well, there was, well, the tablecloth we put down was um, this rainbow wrapping paper, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so I put them on and I looked at it and it was a crazy amount of like um, different colors I've never really seen before, <laughs> I guess. And then there's also these cupcakes on the table. There's one without them, without the glasses, I saw them as blue. But then when I put the glasses on, uh, it, was a, it was teal. Oh, wow. Yeah, so everything was more vibrant. Yes. And you had been, I guess, building things in Minecraft, right, that had colors, but you had been not using your site. You'd been using codes that they list on the blocks. They tell you what color they are in Minecraft. So you yes. kind of knew that you had a balance of colors, but then with the glasses, you can see what all those... What are they called, bricks? Uh, they're just blocks, I blocks. guess. Blocks, oh, okay, okay. At one point, you stood on a table, so one of the videos that I saw of someone of looking through the glasses and seeing color for the first time was this kid's, <laughs> and which is why they're here tonight. <laughs> and at one point, it was such a great part of the video, you stood up on the table and you kind of shouted, this is the world for you guys? What, <laughs> what the dot, 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 dot. So what were we responding, like how does, how does the world seem so different when you look through, like what were you thinking about what other people see versus what you see? Well, so I was at Esther Simplot Park, so it, that park has like lots of like grass, and since um, the type of color blindness I have has a weakness for reds and greens, um, I hadn't seen as much green in the grass and everything around it, so when I put it on, it was all crazy vibrant, and like <laughs> I'd never seen it before in my life. Oh, wow. So does grass look kind of yellow without the glasses? No, they just look less green, I less guess. Less green. Like they're like very, very, very dull. Dull grass. Yes. Oh, boy. That does make the park less exciting. <laughs> so how often do you wear these glasses? Like, um, and when do you choose to put them on? Like you're like, ah, I want to see what, what the color is. Well, I usually wear them any chance I get, and like especially when I'm like doing art and stuff. And it works mostly in the daytime, so I don't really ever use it at night because it's harder to see the colors at night. Yeah. Especially because the ones I had were um, sunglasses, so it was even harder to see at night. Oh, so. true. But you'd have a really good reason to wear your sunglasses at night, though. <laughs> yes. Is there um, something that you like about the way you see the world without the glasses? That, um, that's like, okay, you guys are cool seeing these colors, but guess what? This is kind of cool about the way I see the world. Well, I'm like a very sentimental person, so um, I had been seeing my whole life um, with colorblindness, so I just, I'm just so used to seeing like, my world like that. Yeah, it's the world that is your world. Yes. <laughs> and you're kind of sentimental about that, huh? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's really sweet. Um, do you know who this character is, this balloon character back yes. here? It's Pikachu from the Pokemon series. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you like Pikachu? Uh, I don't, I'm not actually really into Pokemon or anything like no, that. No, all right. Well, that'll make the next moment a little awkward. But, <laughs> but these are colors that you see really well without your glasses, right? Because uh, yellow is not a problem. Yes. Oh, except for his cheeks are red, yeah, I guess maybe. And like the inside of his mouth is like pink. Pink tongue is a little... Is a little weird. Well, what is really crazy about tonight is it's actually your 11th birthday tonight. Yes, it's today's my birthday. <laughs> so, 
Uh, for your birthday, you can choose to take this balloon of a character that you really don't care about. <laughs> Or you can leave him here because in the Story Story Night tradition, for some reason, this comes up again in tonight's show. <laughs> but if you want a Pikachu balloon, it's yours. If you don't, then you can just take your glasses and I'll, but I'll give you a poster of the show. How about that? Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Maxwell. And um, for those of you who have come to Story Story Night a lot, you know whenever technology is introduced, we never know what will happen, because uh, it doesn't always go the way we plan. Uh, but I do have a slide here that Rob sent that is a little helpful, and it's probably going to take me a couple of seconds. So that top, I don't, uh, we're looking at a chart with one is labeled normal and the other is labeled protanopia. And there are numbers going across from 700 to 400. And the top one shows a wide spectrum of color of dark red all the way to a deep purple. And the bottom one, more than half of the bar is sort of a yellow tone. And then there's just kind of a blue and darker blue. So that bottom, band is what Maxwell sees um, without his glasses. And if both those bands look the same to you, then that's also what you see. <laughs> All right, I think we can bring our featured storytellers up in reverse order. Uh, so our final storyteller tonight learned to see her brother in a new way, and that's Tori Christensen. Here comes Tori. Our second storyteller uh, had a hard time seeing his final destination even when the airlines were running on schedule. Mr. David Fitch. Yeah, anywhere you like. And first up to the mic is a man who learned to see the world in a new way through a camera. Uh, returning to Story Story Night, coming straight to the mic here, Mr. Jeff Walker. Although we, we are starting. We've never done this before. You're the reason we have all this technology here tonight. We're starting with a visual impression. So. You can stand at this mic awkwardly while I move back to the computer and advance to the next slide. And Jody, do I need to describe myself? Like, yes, okay. Yes, don't okay. stand there awkwardly. Okay. Yourself. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm uh, six foot, uh, middle aged, uh, bald, glasses, uh, brown eyes, and a slim build. A photograph. No embellishments. A photograph appears on a very large projection screen in the front of the room, suspended by wires over the stage. A colorful wood duck faces the camera, floating on still water. Feathers on the head and cheeks are vivid green, fading to vibrant blue. Breast feathers are red. Eyes are red with a black pupil in the center. Its red, white, and black beak is outlined in yellow. About two years ago, I was having a phone call with my father. He's about 87 years old. In the middle of the phone call, he goes, I've got to go. I've got to go see the International Space Station and fly over my house. And I thought, well, Dad, what are you talking about? It's like, oh, yeah, just, just we got to hang up. I've got to go. It's time to go. I'm like, so you're going to step out and you can actually see? Yeah, with my own eyes, I can watch the International Space Station go over the house. And I said, well, how do you know that? I'm like, I've got to go. I'm like, well, just before you go, like, explain that. And he goes, I've got an app from NASA. I'll send it to you, and you can see this. So I hung up, and I was kind of stunned, sat there stunned for a minute, because all day long I'd been sitting on a Zoom calls, trying to see people's world through these tiny little boxes in the basement of my house. And the whole concept of being able to step out of your house, look up, and, get, uh, and see the sight of the International Space Station going over your head really struck me. So about a day later, I receive an email from my dad, he uh, sets me up with a uh, text message alert system 
that allows me to identify when the International Space Station is flying over Boise. So about two weeks later, I get this text message saying, look out your door about an hour from now to the southwest and look up. And from, from about southwest to the northeast, in just one, about one minute, I just see this kind of light go over my, over my head. It was blinking quickly. I thought it was an airplane, but it realized as fast as moving, it was the space station. So that really intrigued me. After spending all day in a place where all I'm thinking about is what's right in front of me and what my outlook is telling me to do next, it kind of gave me a sense of freedom that I could look up and see something beyond just myself. So I started to research and find out that not only could I track the space station, but there's one moment in time at which the space station and the moon's trajectories align. And for one second or less, you can actually see the International Space Station with the moon in the background. And so I thought to myself, okay, I've got this fancy camera that I've never taken off of auto anything. <laughs> and so, so let's begin this journey of number one, trying to figure out my camera and try to figure out how to take a picture of something 250 miles away, going 17,000 miles per hour in one second or less. So I thought, okay, that's, that's pretty straightforward. And so <laughs> from there, I began my journey kind of like I would if I was training for a race. Just start with little steps and start to kind of start this longer journey. So as I, after I got done with my phone calls, after I got done with all my Zoom meetings, I would grab my camera, head outside to the green belt, and start walking along, twisting the knobs, turning the dials, trying to figure out how to make this mechanical beast work. And along the way, I started to play this game of kind of a scavenger hunt, a visual scavenger hunt. And on that scavenger hunt, I was trying to figure out how to use this mechanical device to try to figure out what is the nature of things, where is light, where is composition, and really starting to understand like what is out there. So on one of my first journeys as I was going out into this world of visual scavenger hunt, I stumbled across what I thought was something happening in nature, something exciting in nature. So I'm fumbling with my dials, and I turn and I take a blurry picture of two birds fighting. A photo against a blue sky, a brown bird, a hawk, is perched at the top of a tree branch. On top of the bird is perched another bird with outstretched wings. So I was pretty excited when I downloaded a picture because, oh, I, I had to have found something pretty cool as, as these birds were fighting, something in nature, something exciting, and I was able to kind of capture it at that first time. And when I looked closer, I realized I'd taken pictures of two birds mating. <laughs> and so, so my first experience with a camera was really, picked, it was really basically bird, por bird pornography. <laughs> and so that was kind of where I started as I went through this process. So I reached out and continued to, continued to take these little nature walks and really try to identify things to see, things to do. So I decided, well, if I'm going to see the birds, I might as well go take a look at the bees. And so I was able to find the smallest of things in nature to take a picture of next. A close-up photo, image of a golden-colored honeybee captured in flight, pollen visible on its back legs. The bee is hovering in front of the center of a flower made up of dozens of tightly packed yellow and orange flower stamen. When I finished with the bees, my journey continued on. And as my nature walks got longer, I started to think about, I need to figure out how to look farther out, a distance, a ways away from just kind of normal life. And again, continuing on that journey of looking up and looking out from just that daily routine of Zoom. So I set my sight to take a look and see if I could capture the Milky Way on the way to, on my journey towards the International Space Station. A photo, two sandstone rock formations against the night sky. The sky is filled with hundreds of stars, shown as small white points of light. There's a band of densely clustered stars arranged in a line across the sky, known as the Milky Way. So, from, so as I go through and I start to chart where the moon is, how it, how it goes, how the International Space Station goes, and whether I could get to it within driving time of Boise, it turns, from like, it, it turns from like weeks into months and, and, and goes from summer to fall to winter. Identify a time which, which the two are going to be aligned. It's going to actually be at the stage stop at about 11 p.m. just right outside of Mountain Home. So here it is, a little before Christmas, and I have the map going out and I have to start kind of thinking about how am I going to accomplish this. It turns into a system of lists. It is like create a go bag with your warm clothes, create a go bag with your tripod, create, you know, you're going through the list. You got your, you got your uh, um, headlamp, you got your camera, you got your extra batteries, you got your, 
everything. And the key thing about all this is, as you can tell already, I plan my spontaneity. It's a really important part of my life. <laughs> so as we're going towards this, towards Christmas, one of the things you have to do when planning this as well is like take, is really watch the weather. And that was the critical part, is all of a sudden you have to have the, you, you start to pick up the National Weather Service and you start to look at what is the percentage of cloud cover. Is it clear, is it cloudy, partly cloudy? Where are the storm fronts coming? So about seven days out, I'm watching the future cast of Larry Gebert at that time and like just trying to see when the storm fronts are coming. It looks clear, it looks good. And then I, was, I get my apps going and all of a sudden I've got the hourly forecast. I'm trying to identify you know, where, where is the winds coming from? Where is the stars going to be? Are the clouds going to come in? I'm counting down about three days out. All of a sudden, 12 hours before I'm supposed to go, a storm comes rolling in over the Waihees, around the bend, and right over that part of mountain home where it gets slick, cloudy, ice is over. There's no way I can see the moon. So I kind of step back and say, OK, let's see what else I can practice on. What else can I do as I try to wait out and plot out the next trajectories that will match those two up? So, the, so as I kind of chase this, chase this dragon in the sky, I go down to the Boise Greenbelt, and I'm able to witness the migration of the bald eagles to the Boise River in the winter. A photo, two leafless tree branches. On one is perched a brown feathered bird with white head and white tail feathers and bright yellow beak. Yellow feet with long talons grasp around the tree branch, and intense yellow eyes stare directly at the camera, wings closed the bald eagle. And the fun thing about this is as winter turns into spring and into summer, as I'm trying to track the trajectories, you learn a little bit more about what is out there, what is beyond your line of sight. And I get to experience something that I never thought I'd get to see, which is a once in a lifetime comet over the city of Boise. A photo, Boise city lights and dark foothills at the bottom of the image. A sunset sky, blue at the top of the image, fading to orange at the bottom of the image. Arching down across the image is a bright white point of light with a white tail, the comet. Summer comes around and I'm starting to see things line up again. This time it's going to be the trajectory is going to take the moon and the space station somewhere between Boise and Idaho City. And as, as I map it out, it looks like it's going to be around Hilltop Cafe. It's going to be 11 p.m. at night and I'm going to be able to sit up there and take a look south, southwest and try to get those two as they align. I'm checking the weather, it looks clear and clear and nice. It's summer, I'm checking the smoke forecast. What's the smoke gonna be? And then as I get closer, three days out, after listening to the weather forecast, I hear a random thing on the news. The Chinese have, have launched an anti-satellite weapon impacting one of their satellites, scattering a cloud of debris in the air. I was like, man, no way. Sp space forecasting, something I hadn't even considered. So I ran downstairs, and I can literally see like the trajectory just dropping around. This, the astronauts had to basically you know, create a maneuver to move around these debris to save their lives. And here it was. I was like, okay, there's my, there my, 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 my summertime shot. So I continued to look and map where the trajectories are going to be, hoping they'd be, continue to be consistent as they would. As, fall moved, as summer moved into fall, I, be, I started to practice on different shots of the moon to try to understand how to put, bring it into focus and how to project that image into the lens of my camera. And from that, I was lucky enough to, to identify a really wonderful moon place, which is the old penitentiary as the moon rises during the harvest moon of the fall. A photo against the dark night sky, a close-up image of the foothill called Table Rock appearing black against the sky. Mounted on top of the flat plateau of the hill is a very tall, blue, lighted cross sculpture. Behind the cross is the full moon, which takes up almost all of the background of the image. As fall turns into, as, as summer turns into fall, fall turns into winter again, I'm able to identify a two month, a two month out track, which all looks good. It's gonna be the time when the fires have died down and been put out. It's a time when um, in the October skies, they have really the, the, the storm clouds have not started gathering yet. And where it looks like it's gonna be as the tracks kind of evolve and what you'll see when you start to track things is even though the moon always has the same trajectory, the International Space Station may vary its orbit just a little bit. And so the farther out you are, the more distance you, you, you have in this kind of bullseye you're trying to hit. And so I have this choice as I watch over seven weeks, am I gonna be going to Weezer? Am I gonna be going to Bruno? I just don't know. And slowly the targets start shrinking down. Am I gonna be in CUNA? Am I gonna be somewhere out of Orchard? 
and finally identify with about one week out, my spot is going to be south of the airport, under the Doppler radar, near the BLM horse, uh, horse corrals, just short of the penitentiary. So of course, I tell my wife, hey, I'm going to be getting up about 3.45 in the morning. I'm going to head towards the state pen. Don't worry about it. It's, it's totally safe. It's totally cool. I'm going to be just heading out in the desert by myself. Nobody around early in the morning. She rolls over and she falls asleep. It's cool. <laughs> so basically, at this point, I'm checking the forecast. It's clear. I drive out there. I set my watch. I get up at 3.45 AM. I roll into the right next to the horse corral. The horses are a little kind of concerned, not sure why there's a car there at that time of day. I park the car a little bit to the west because the wind's blowing. It's starting to kind of make the tripod kind of wiggle a little bit and try and get the stars set up. I get the, uh, get the camera focused on the moon. And one of the frustrating parts of the moon you forget is it's always moving. And so the thing about it is you always have to try to figure out your frame of reference and how to get it to go through it and diagonal through it all because it's not a static thing as you, as, you, as you begin to learn. And the other thing too that I forgot about until just the last moment was like, I had to get the shot at 4.46 and 37 seconds as it passed. Now on my iPhone, you can't set an alarm by the seconds. You can only set it by the minute. So the plan they came up with was gonna set a five minute ready, a two minute set, and a one minute go alarm. So basically the whole concept was at five minutes, I line the camera, at two minutes, I don't touch anything, and at one minute, I hit the trigger. So I'm ready to go. Winds are good, horses are calm, the moon's in sight, everything's crystal clear. The alarm goes off at five. It's in, it's, it's in the frame. Alarm goes off at two, I back up, don't touch anything. At one, I just sma I gently hit the trigger the camera. And at that point, you hear this like bam, 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 bam. Between 15 and 20 frames per second are going off at that point, which means I cannot see what is happening. You just kind of see this blur of images going by. And so one minute, it let off, and I'm wondering, Number one, did my SD card buffer? Did it get all the images? Did it get stuck? I don't know what happened. So I grab my camera, and I slowly I start scrolling through. All I can see is just a blank picture of the moon. A close-up photo image of the full moon, gray and white with craters and mountains against the black of space. The image of the moon takes up the entire photo. I continue to stroll. Literally, there's, if you do the, do, do the math, there's hundreds of shots in there. And I'm just looking for any sort of speck to go across till finally I pause on something. I think I see a speck. I zoom in on it, and this is what I see. A very close-up photo image of the moon. 25% of the moon takes up the entire photo. Very tiny image of the space station can be seen as a black silhouette against the moon. Yeah. I was lucky enough to peer into Seven Souls' little tiny little apartment up there, just zooming by at 70,000 miles per hour. A little bit of voyeuristic, but at the same time, it brought me back to where I started, which is number one is, this, you know, the photo's a little blurry, but it was super exciting just for those birds that I saw doing it. I got to see something <laughs> that I never got to see in nature until I started to make that effort to go see something and do something beyond that little tiny box in my basement and the inspiration of my dad. And so as I go forward, from this, you can get a sense of like how fast the International Space Station goes by and the sense of time that we all have here. A video. Half the moon takes up the entire screen. The black silhouette of the space station moves diagonally across the moon, passing across very quickly in 0.79 seconds. So. Yeah. And so just kind of finish the journey, you know, in, in particle physics, there's this term that's called the observer effect, where when you observe something at the very smallest level, you actually change the, change the outcome, and you change, the, change what occurs. And I think for me, when I take it up to this scale, it, is taking the time to observe this and participate in this changed me for the better. I got to get a sense of a little bit more, I could hear things better when I go out in the woods, I could see things a little bit differently, the light's a little bit better when I, when I look around. <laughs> And I get a sense of my space within the whole universe itself. And it was just a journey for me. And so, and finally, what I really realized is I go out there and take these pictures, whether it's birds doing it or seven souls that are circling the earth, 
as long as I'm there and prepared to take what's, take what's given to me, be grateful for what is there, and accept the outcome, and just be grateful that I can experience it. If I can remember that after all of, all of this, I will have a wonderful life. And when I'm sitting in my, in my little chair eating PBR and drinking Cheez-Its, or drinking, drinking PBR and eating Cheez-Its <laughs> and relaxing, you know, I know there's a larger world out there that I can go out and experience with my sight. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You know, and everything technological, all of our equipment worked perfectly for your story. <laughs> However, I did get a text from the tech booth that we lost control of the house lighting. So if it was going to go wrong, at least it went wrong over there and not over here. Uh, but I do want to expose the, well, not expose, reveal, no, it's still not the right word. Bring out the talented person that is behind the voice that you heard describing the images, Terry Dillion. Thanks, Jody. Pardon me? Oh, okay. Uh, so I thought of you when we, when Jeff and I started brainstorming about doing this tonight because I was at a performance by Open Arms Dance Company and although I was not one of the people that got to hear what you did, I saw in the program that the audio description of dance was by Terry Dillion. And so I called you up and said, hey, uh, could you do something like that for us? But how did you come into this world of audio description? You know, um, when I was working at Hewlett Packard, I became a member of the uh, disability Employee Impact Network. And right now, I or no one in my family is living with a disability, but I'm an aging person, so I know it will happen. And I have little grandkids, and I wanted to be able to talk about disability to them in an intelligent and contemporary way. And so that's how I started. But Open Arms knew that I'd been for many years a voiceover actor and that I had this experience. And so they contacted me to say, here we are, a dance company for people with, living with disabilities, but people who have sight issues can't see it. Would you be interested in doing an audio description? So I did a lot of research and worked it up and it's uh, fantastic to describe dance. Then I go to the Nutcracker and I think of all those grandparents wanting to see their little kids on stage, you know, who might have macular degeneration or mm. diabetes and they can't see it. And so uh, that's how I got started. That's so cool. And it is a benefit that you also have a beautiful voice because I can imagine just our experience tonight if instead we heard like, a full moon fills <laughs> a large part of the screen. <laughs> like, wouldn't be the same experience. <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm con continuing my um, certification in uh, audio description because when I look at the American Council for Blindness uh, audio description project, nothing is listed from Idaho. Hmm. And so I'm like, gosh darn it, I need to bring audio description to theater or... Mm -hmm. dance or the art museum or historical museum so that we're listed as being supportive yeah, I love that you're doing limited that. vision thank you so much yeah thank you all right we have reached the point in our show where we will have a slammer from our slammer box so Ben if you will bring that up here maybe we have some uh, mysterious music as we draw a... yes that's very suspenseful <laughs> All right, here it comes. Let's see who we got, who, who will have the opportunity to audio describe themselves. It's very revealing what people choose to describe. It looks like it's gonna be Elise Carlson. Elise. <laughs> you look awfully familiar. Elise, did you tell a slam last month? Okay, Elise is back by popular demand. Now, we do have a, now just so you know, for next month, we do have a rule that if you slam in the show right before, you have to take a month off. So you're gonna have to take a month off for January. Was hearing your best story or sight the better one? Because you can back off now if you want and come back for hearing. You're gonna do sight? Okay. 
All right, now remember, like I told you last time, no swearing and no like rough, no rough scenes. Okay, hello? Okay, hi. Um, my name is Elise. I have blonde hair, blue, green, gray. I've heard a lot of things about my eyes. Um, I'm tall for my age, apparently. Um, and yeah, so when I was probably, probably last year, it was during COVID, when I was probably eight or nine, I begged my parents to get chickens because I wanted chickens and I thought they'd be cute. <laughs> um, so, I was like, can I please have chickens? Come on, we can get eggs. I, I really wanted chickens. I, I, I just like animals. Well, anyways, after I tried convincing them for like, I don't know, a month, I, went, I kept convincing them. Eventually, they were like, okay, maybe it's a good idea. We can get eggs, you know, like maybe it's good. So. One like April day, we drove off to this place. We got these two little, little chickens, and one of them was gray, one of them was brown, and they're very, very cute. And then two weeks later, we got two other chickens. Now, there's one named Spot. She was gray, and then there is Bullet. She was from the second week. One, she's white. There was the light brown one from the first week, and her name's Nugget. And then there's little Brown, who was from the second week, and yeah, he was also Brown. Well, I would, they had, we had our first um, Easter together, and um, I put them in giant mini plastic eggs because I thought it was cute. But they, they were big, they were big, don't worry. They could breathe. Um, it was really, really cute. I brought it to my friend's house and told them I had a gift for them. And she kind of got freaked out because she doesn't like chickens. Anyways. I would play piano to them, and they would fall asleep. It was really cute. But like, two months later, I woke up to cock it in loo And I was like, what is that? It's like seven in the morning. Wait, wait, what? This isn't good. Because we used to live in Portland, and in Portland, we lived in the city, and you can't have roosters. And I knew no one else had roosters in our neighborhood or at least chickens for that matter. So I was like, not good, not good, not good, no, no, nope, mm -mm, nope. Anyways, I woke up and I ran downstairs and I went into her backyard. So I started by going to spot and I stared at her and I probably said something like, are you a rooster? And she probably looked at me like, you're, no, you're really weird. And that's pretty much true, but, I went on to Bullet, and she just ran away from me because she's a really skittish chicken. Nugget um, just was really, really loud and stared at me. And then I came to Little Brown, and I was about to grab him, and he went, cock it up, and I'm like, no. I was sad. We had actually just gotten these chicken harnesses from Etsy. So we, we we're gonna we we're gonna walk them around our neighborhood. <laughs> it's a chicken person thing. Um, I also before we had to give him away to this farm. He was really pretty. He had these like emerald. He was like emerald. But um, I remember that I spent so much time with him in that like one month of space before we actually gave him away to this farm. I would wake up at like 5 a.m. and I'd pick him up and bring him into our, the family room and watch TV with him. It was the cutest thing. I also made him a chicken diaper multiple times. It was like cutting holes out of this old rag and like, picking him up and putting him in it. It was really cute. And then we had to say goodbye to him. He's probably still alive, hopefully. Mm. Oh, well, we dropped him off at this friend's farm and um, to this day, he's probably happy that he's not with the other chickens, because the other chickens sometimes get this thing called chicken spot egg, and I'll bring them inside, and I'll wash them off, and I'll paint their nails. <laughs> so, yeah, he's probably happy he's gone. But, 
it was just so cool seeing that he was big now, but no, we had to give him away. Anyways, that was my story. Thank you for listening. Um, yeah. Thank you, Elise. Hey, um, do you like Pikachu? I do. You do? Do you want to take the Pikachu balloon as your storytelling prize? <laughs> All right, I think you're the perfect person to get Pikachu. Just keep it low if there are people sitting behind you, okay? Thank you. Oh, there she goes. I mean, I live in a pretty cool neighborhood, but if I see anyone walking down the street with a chicken in a harness, I'm putting my house up for sale. <laughs> Some of my neighbors are here tonight, so <laughs> they know how to get rid of me, I guess. You know, the other weird thing, I guess the thing for that for sight is that it's very hard to tell the sex of a chicken. You have to like have special training, but I thought if you ordered them, somebody who had that training was supposed to help you with that. I guess not. It's a, did you get your chickens from Etsy? Okay. We had, uh, when we were virtual two seasons ago, we were at a studio um, over in West Boise and we were basically became a TV show and we, could, we had a LED screen at the back of the theater where we could see up to 300 audience members. Um, actually, Karen Mark, who's sitting here, her sister came in from New York. I think that was Let's Make a Deal. You both wore great costumes, I remember that. But one of the screens, we could see nothing in it except a chicken. <laughs> and it was sitting in a little chair and just watching the show. <laughs> And we tried to talk to the people, and their mic they couldn't get their microphone off of mute, so all we saw was their feet walking around in the screen. And the chicken just sat there looking at us the whole show, and that's, that was one of our highlights from, from Story Story Night TV version. <laughs> yeah, it just got better from there. Uh, let's bring up our next featured storyteller. Uh, this is a man who I pounced upon at our late night season over at the Visual Arts Collective. He shared a story, and I just had a sneaky suspicion that he would be a perfect featured storyteller for this series, so we transplanted him from the late night show to the flagship show. Please welcome David Fitch. <laughs> Jody. All right, I am a white man, slender build, about five foot ten, a little past middle age, a gray hair. I'm wearing sunglasses because these lights wig my eyes out. More on that later. Uh, and I'm wearing some Cayman skin cowboy boots so for those that can't see all that. So I inherited a visual disorder that showed up when I was about five years old and has gradually gotten worse uh, over my lifetime. Uh, the upshot of this disorder is that I can't drive, I can't see regular print, I can't see signs, and I have a devil of a time recognizing people. Uh, I can see large things, I can walk around, uh, I can navigate stairs. I can even dance on a crowded dance floor without bumping into people. So those are all pluses. I've even discovered a few positive aspects to declining vision. I've met a lot of new people, usually when I thought they were somebody I knew, until <laughs> uh, I got close enough. Uh, I also made several failed attempts at learning to play musical instruments through my life, and it wasn't until about 10 years ago when my eyesight finally got so bad I couldn't see any musical notes and I was forced to listen. Uh, well, this allowed me to play music with other people and I do that frequently now. It's a source of a lot of entertainment and enjoyment for me. Uh, the last is pointed out by my wife that I'm popular with her and some other people because uh, from my perspective, everyone's skin is getting smoother every year. <laughs> so, I clawed my way through engineering school. Uh, that was a chore uh, because of my eyesight and attention span. Uh, I frequently figured out how to do things by finding a solved problem and then working it backwards and figuring out the process from there. 
And I'm assuming this must have been an endearing quality because that's where I met my wife and we've been married for 44 years. So that was a, that was a plus. Once I got through school, I figured by that time, between my eyesight and my attention span, uh, I wasn't really gonna be able to work as an engineer. So I joined a large multinational technology company, corporation, and gravitated towards the business side of things. I went around and sold concepts of new technologies that the company was developing and traveled around doing that some, and then eventually gravitated towards my true niche and skill, which was being a professional apologizer <laughs> for all those projects that didn't quite come to fruition or didn't quite work out, but we still wanted to do business with them. Uh, they need a face of the corporation to discuss this with. <laughs> so, for the large part, that, that worked well for the first several years. I did a lot of traveling. Um, and because I was going into some heated situations where slings and arrows were being cast, nobody wanted to go with me. That's why I traveled alone. And uh, again, that worked in the first years. I made it around the United States, even to several countries and back. But as my eyesight diminished, it became more and more of a challenge, particularly in crowded airports. Um, there's always somebody shouting at a, over the loudspeaker at you in an airport with very useful pieces of information like, some bags look alike, make sure it's yours. <laughs> or, this is a no smoking facility. Or, my favorite, stay with your bag. Unattended bags will be confiscated and destroyed. These are not useful things, uh, but they do set a good threatening tone. <laughs> I never heard a notice that said, go left here if you want to go to gate A or A, B gates. Go right if you want to go to the C or D gates. That would have been useful. Another, particularly in the Denver airport, when you're standing waiting for the tram, is get on the tram on this side of the hallway if you want to go to terminals A, B, or C. Get in the tram on this side of the hallway if you want to leave the airport or take another trip through security. <laughs> I've done this a few times. As the years passed, I found myself in the wrong line more and more frequently, on the wrong tram, going the wrong direction, heading off the wrong direction in the airport. This is very stressful when you're in a hurry. And I was missing flights. So between the stress, missing connections, I thought something had to change. Uh, this, maybe I couldn't do this part of my career. Maybe I had to go fly a desk, but then people are always handing you things to read. So I didn't like that idea. I came upon one of the rarer things you'll find in an airport, which is an airline employee who is not in a mad rush hurry or being verbally abused by irate travelers. So I had a discussion with this person, explained my situation, and they said, oh, you can request visual assistance from the airline and we'll help you through that. Oh, great, how do you do that? Well, go online. <laughs> so I, I went online, I start up my computer, I fire off some magnification software, I hook it to a large external television to use as a monitor, I search around on the site for how to request assistance, I check the boxes for Yes, I need visual assistance. No, I don't need a wheelchair. What type of visual assistance do you need? Fill in all my information. This is a process just made for people with poor eyesight. <laughs> but I did it. Then the process would work, and I tried this on several US flights. I come in, I go to the ticket gate, ticket counter, give them my ID, and they give me my boarding pass, and they say, a, a guide will be here shortly, and a guide would show up with a wheelchair. Well, this hits my ego. I can still walk. I can still navigate around. I don't need a wheelchair. I just need somebody to guide me to make sure I go through the right line and get to the right gate. So in general, they would give up on the wheelchair, guide me through the right line, guide me to my gate. I would get there, dropped off. Once I know where my gate is, 
I don't have that much trouble after that. They would leave me, I would wander around, usually get something to eat. They'd call the flight. When I go to the ticket agent, I'd say, can you tell me my seat row and letter? They'd tell me. I'd go onto the airplane, ask the flight attendant, what row am I coming in on? They would tell me, and then I'd count them up. Count, 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 till I get to my row. It's A, B, C, yeah, I know which order that goes in, I'd find my seat. That worked well. And then I was invited to go to Beijing, China to a few irate customers. And I went to the website, put in all my information requesting visual assistance. Then I learned my four phrases, uh, ni hao, xie xie, Debuchi and Huidar. And these are the Chinese, or Mandarin Chinese phrases for hello, thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Huidar is a drinking toast, just in case none of the rest of it works. That will get you through any country in the world. So I, went, I go to a US airport, check in at the ticket desk. The guide shows up. We have a discussion about wheelchairs. They took me through the security line, took me to, through the airport to the gate, handed me off to the gate agent, very friendly, and they said, leave him here with us, we'll take good care of Mr. Fitch. My guide takes off, she says, have a seat there, we're gonna call you in a minute. A little bit later, she calls me up, and she says, Audrey here will take you to the airplane. I went, oh, great, that's more service than I usually get. Audrey's a charming young woman. And she says, do you need to hold on to me? I thought, need? <laughs> Such a subjective word. Uh, it would be nice, but no, I don't, I don't actually need that. I just need to get to the right place. And thank goodness she did take me because we went down the jetway. Instead of getting on a plane, we went on a hallway that goes out across the tarmac and on the sides, we go past all these openings. And over each opening, there's some letters and numbers which I can't see. And through each opening, I see a nice, shiny jetliner beckoning all the travels. Come, come get on me. I'm going to take you somewhere fantastic. She took me past all those to my aircraft, which was another shiny aircraft beckoning to me. Put me on the airplane. I ask what, the, what row I'm getting in on. Count up, get on my seat and think, all right. I, escape the first pitfall, I didn't get on the wrong airplane. So you have to take multiple air flights from here to get to China, and you have to go through Singapore. Well, Singapore has a reputation of being super efficient and very rule oriented. So I went there, I had to stay overnight, I come into the Singapore airport, go to the ticket desk, hand them my ID, and they said, ah, Mr. Fitch, here's your boarding pass, here's the guide, it's gonna come up, no wheelchair. I thought, oh, they are efficient. They actually read the thing. She says, come with me. She took me to the security office and says, please stay in the security office here. A guide will be here shortly to take you to your gate. Okay, sit there, I'm waiting. While I'm waiting, in walked a family, a man, his wife, and a child in a stroller. And there's a security officer with them and they're having a rather heated discussion. And the discussion is centered around the security officers telling them, your travel visa is not good yet. You got here too early. And he says, well, I didn't change the schedule. The air airline changed the schedule. And he says, doesn't matter. Your travel visa is not good. You're here too early. <laughs> and they're, so they're upset saying, well, so you mean we got to stay here until you know, the clock goes past midnight? And he said, well, not exactly. We have to put you under arrest. Arrest, the wife is a little upset now. He says, well, don't worry, don't worry. It's a nice holding facility. Uh, <laughs> we'll put you in that and we'll come get you and then take you to the, back to the airport when your travel visa becomes good. Well, this is an eye opener for me listening to this. And before I could find out how that all resolved itself, my guy showed up, Mr. Fitch, give me your boarding pass, give me your passport, follow me. So I followed her. We come to the first security line, and we go around it. She shows some credentials to the security officers there. We just walk around them. 
Well, um, my ego's pretty puffed up. Now I'm a VIP. I don't even have to go through security lines now. I just walk past this person, wave at the proletariat who are still having to stand in line. She takes me off to my, I'm thinking she's taking me off to my gate. She walks in and puts me in the nursery and says, stay here. Well, I'd seen what they had happened if you didn't follow the rules, so I wasn't going to leave. <laughs> now I'm stuck in a nursery for some indeterminate amount of time. I settled down, but my ego's shrunk down. I was a VIP a minute ago. <laughs> I sat in these little tiny chairs and played with some of the toys, and they, <laughs> they even have some puzzles just made for me. They got like four pieces, <laughs> big pieces in there, so I... Messed around with those for a while until the guide came and she took me and says, uh, come with me, here's the, here's the gate, and they're ready to board. I asked the gate agent my seat. She says, you're in row 15, seat A, perfect. I got on the plane, asked the flight attendant, what row is this? This is row five you're getting in on. Oh, okay, great, so I'm five, six, seven, I count them up till I get to 15 and and I'm there, and there's a woman there, an Asian woman, and she's watching me, and she says, why are you counting? And I explained to her about my eyesight. I can't see, so I'm trying to make sure I'm in the right place. Double check with her. Start to put my suitcase up overboard, and three people, all Asian people, come around me, and they start handing me their boarding passes. <laughs> well, they don't speak English, and I, you know, they weren't talking about drinking. We're apologizing. So I asked the woman in my seat row, what's going on? She says, they want you to show them to their seats. And she's laughing. So I show the boarding pass to her. She reads it. I count up and down and get these three people to their seats. There's a little irony in it, but, but I was having a good time. So my ego's pumped back up again. All right, I'm an experienced traveler. These people, they've got perfect eyesight, but still don't know what's going on. I was able to help, got everything stowed away, sat down, sit in my airplane seat for six hours, another six hours, get to Beijing, I'm getting off the plane, and she says, Mr. Fitch, here is your wheelchair attendant. <laughs> and here's a young man with a wheelchair, and he's pointing to the wheelchair, and I try to explain to him, but you know, a drinking toast doesn't seem appropriate, uh, you know, I've only got four phrases, and he's having none of it. She's saying something which is clearly, get in the wheelchair. His job is to put me in that wheelchair and get me out of the airport. So I'm all right, fine. So they loaded me and my suitcase and my ego into this wheelchair and I sat there and I started to look around and there's five other people, all Asian, all twice my age, all almost comatose because we've been sitting on an airplane for six hours and that's enough to make anybody comatose. And he maneuvers me around a little bit and lines me up with some of the other wheelchairs and they start moving us down the hallway and there, I realize there's six of us and two wheelchair attendants. So we're each going down one side of the hallway in a relay. <laughs> they move me up about 20 yards, park me, he runs back. <laughs> Gets the third wheelchair in line, runs up, so we're kind of doing this leapfrog pattern. Well, I don't have enough Chinese to try to explain how the efficiencies work in this, but after a while, I, start, I, I sat there, I noticed, I look over, and here comes this gentleman, Asian gentleman, and he's just about even with me, and we're kind of looking at each other across the hallway. His attendant got there first and starts moving him up, and he's got a big smile on his face. He gets moved up. Well, my, my attendant comes up and moves me up just a little bit ahead of him. So now we're staring across this thing in a race that we have no control over. We're sitting in our wheelchairs with our suitcases in our laps, smiling at each other, waiting for our attendants, hoping we're gonna be there first. His comes up, I mean, he's leaning forward. I could almost see his hair blowing back in this race, having a good time going down this hallway. Finally got to the end, they hand him off to his family, they hand me off to my corporate handlers. He's waving goodbye and smiling, and I finally realized that despite all of the shortcomings of this trip and the challenges, I asked for help, 
They gave me help. They got me where I was going. And my eyesight wasn't even the biggest issue. It was my ego. <laughs> it took a ride on this, up and down, up and down. But if I was able to just let the ego settle down there, I already made a connection with somebody across a generation, across a language barrier, and across cultures from opposite sides of the planet. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I once went through the Shanghai airport uh, many years ago on my way to do a theater production uh, research in India, but uh, those phrases you learned were all seemed pretty useful. The only phrase we went in with was, the mango is beautiful but sour. <laughs> and <laughs> I never got to use it. it was, all the mangoes were ugly. I don't, you know, it was... <laughs> Uh, let's, can we, oh dear, there's no one at the tech booth. Uh, can we turn the, the video projector back on? Maybe that, okay, here he goes, running like the wind. Um, I'm gonna check in with our $5,000 match. Oh, there it is. Oh, look, and we have new people. Look at that, Jeff Rogers, which is a very specific amount of 7772. <laughs> Thank you for that. Judy and Susan and Fawn and Kristen. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we've got $1,300, which translates to $2,600 heading to Story Story Night. And you know, these are, people are like, well, what's so expensive about your show? I mean, there are, we were required to have insurance. We're, we have rental of this space. We pay a stipend to our musicians, our photographer, um, we are sound tech engineer, video producer. Uh, so there are uh, website hosting, the podcast hosting. So there are lots of different things that add up, the ticketing processing. So that's all what it goes to. Hopefully mostly to people. That's what we try to spend our money on is people. Um, and uh, we have no employees. It's all contractors and volunteers. Um, but we've managed to keep it going now. Starting, this is our now our thirteenth season. So, <laughs> and part of that support tonight, also, we have a little message here from our season sponsor, the Shandro Group. Um, and maybe our musicians want to underscore underscore this a little bit, a little insurance music. <laughs> Yeah, that good old insurance standard. Oh, that's actually an insurance company. <laughs> no, we, we don't think we represent that. Thank you. That sounds great. Yeah, keep that going. Yeah, that's good. The Chandra Group knows there's a difference between offering your employees insurance and benefits. From our first conversation to day-to-day -day benefits management, we use data-driven and culture-focused methods for designing your benefits portfolio. We know no other program in a business can impact employees' financial, emotional, and physical well-being more than employee benefits. The Chandra Group. Thank you, Chandra Group, and hey, thanks for that music. And probably one of the reasons they aren't here tonight is this month is their craziest month because everyone is switching out their insurance plans for their employees this month. And uh, all right, we're going to leave this up during intermission. So you can text SSN2022 to 44321. We're going to take about a 10 minute break. We'll give you a chance to visit the restrooms in the lobby or the bar in the back. And Irreverent Tones is going to play us some tunes during that break, too. So we'll see you for more stories in just about 10 minutes. Into the sky, but the whole world is on fire. Irreverent tones, everybody. Thank you. Thank you guys, thank you. All right, stay up here because we're gonna do something special, right? Here we go. Uh, it's okay if you're still at the bar, you can find your way back to your seats, but remember the young gentleman who's celebrating his birthday well, we've reached his bedtime. And so before he goes, we're hoping you'll join us in the band and singing him happy birthday as he heads off to end his day. Are you guys up for that? We're up, we're All up. All right, hey. here we go. All right, one, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday 
to you. Happy birthday, dear Maxwell. Happy birthday to you. Happy 11th birthday, birthday, Maxwell. May your year be full of as many colors as you want to see. <laughs> Good night, guys. Thank you, family. All right. Very good. Well, as I said, we have a big show tonight, and in one of our bonus materials coming up is, uh, you know, David Fitch, uh, and just about a little, almost exactly a month ago, uh, premiered a new song at the Idaho Songwriters um, Night. You guys play at that too, don't you? Idaho Songwriters over the Sapphire Room? Every now and then? Yeah. And this was a special one, too. It's a song that he wrote over the last, this last year. Uh, but then he invited his daughter to join him for the first time in a duet. And she wrote a verse as well. And you'll hear more about that in a little bit. So uh, back on stage, David Fitch and his daughter. And thank you, Nancy, Lori, Brian, Gail, and Matthew. She wants you on the other side. Okay. Check, 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 check. <laughs> yes. Let's see. All right, right about here. Something to do with my hands. Right, <laughs> right out there, sure. I look mostly the same as when I described myself the first time, uh, except now I'm wearing a guitar and a silver harmonica rack around my neck. As Jody said, I just started writing songs this year and wrote this song about the challenges from our eyesight and shared the video with my daughter Jessica who lives in Boulder and she shared it with a lot of her friends and colleagues because she has the same eye condition that I have um, with some additional challenges so she wrote a verse another verse to it and we uh, did it as a duet uh, this will be our second time so I guess this is a tour uh, <laughs> you're catching the end of our 2022 tour and I'll let Jessica describe herself so I'm five foot six-ish, uh, younger than my father's marriage, uh, curly, blonde, brownish hair, also white, and I don't know, average build. Uh, let's see, I've got a, a sparkly gold and black ensemble today. <laughs> Oh, and I started taking harmonica lessons during the pandemic. So. They're online, too. <laughs> I ride my bicycle. Can't see to drive. I'm dodging cars, just trying to stay alive. They come in so fast, they smell fresh meat. I can't see them coming, so I can't cross the street. Lost again, it's no surprise. Damn my eyes. I can't see the road signs I can't see my phone I can't see maps I'm just trying to get home I ask for directions No one knows where they are How did they get here? Driving their cars Lost again It's no surprise Damn my eyes I 
love to ski. I hike with my pack. But Uber won't come up to drive us back. I tell everyone I'm begging for rides. If no one calls us, we stay home and cry. Lost again is no surprise. Damn my eyes. I walk to the store, searching for food. Tiny dates hide what's not good. Take my best guess, but get home to find my milk's gone way past its prime. Sour cream again, it's no surprise. Damn my eyes. I go downtown Out to the bar Looking, looking for friends, friends But I can't see who you are If you don't say hi I'll be all alone If I can't find you I wanna go home Lost again There's no surprise Damn my eyes Lost again It's no surprise Damn my eyes Thank you. The only, the second time anyone has heard that song live, everybody, and it was you. It was you that heard it. I know our smell show isn't coming up until March, but, you know, I have okay eyes, and I have trouble with the milk, too. And, you know, it ruins it right away if someone at the table says, should we smell it first? And it's like, oh, no, just toss it down the sink. It's over. If you're asking if we should smell it, it's too late. It's already, it's already happened. All right, we're gonna move to our final featured storyteller. Uh, she was in your position just last month, which is a great reminder that anyone can be a featured storyteller just by writing into story at storystorynight.org, or you can call our storyline at 208-917-1970 and pitch your idea for a story on a theme. That's what happened in this case. Uh, our featured storyteller was in the audience at Taste and thought, oh, Sight, I have a good story for Sight. They wrote in, oh, Pikachu, Pikachu is waving at me over there. Hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it was, it was absolutely spot on, the right story for tonight. So we rushed her uh, from her first performance, or seeing Story Story Night, to being a featured storyteller. Please welcome her first time at the microphone, Tori Christensen. everyone, I'm Tori Christensen. I'm a white woman with short hair, wearing glasses and a very sparkly red shirt. <laughs> there came a point in my life when I couldn't see a way forward in my relationship with my little brother. I'd always been really lucky that I got along great with my siblings growing up. I have an older sister who's 10 years older than me, an older brother who's five years older than me, and a younger brother who's three and a half years younger than me. Being that me and my younger brother were closest in age, we were the closest together. 
and we did everything together. PJ was his name, and we loved to walk to the store and get our little lollies and eat them all while we were walking home. We loved to watch TV together. We watched a lot of Pokemon together. It was our favorite show. Um, and we loved, loved, loved to do art together. Something funny about PJ is that he had a really hard time waking up. We could shake him, we could tickle him, we could draw on his stomach, and he just like wouldn't budge. And that continued to be funny to us siblings um, until he started laying down in his first grade class and being unable to be woken up. My mom was very concerned, and as a single mom had to make the sacrifice of taking off work and taking him to doctors, she took him to many doctors and had a hard time being taken seriously until she demanded that he got a test done and finally found a doctor that would order the test. He got the test done for the next day. I knew this was happening, but I was just 11 years old at the time, so I didn't think twice about it. Um, but when the intercom came on in my classroom to tell me to go to the front office and that I was being checked out, I had a sinking feeling that something was wrong. When I got there, my aunt was there to pick me up, but she wouldn't tell me what was going on. But I didn't know we were driving to the hospital. At that time, PJ was preparing for his first brain surgery. At seven years old, they had found two tumors in his brain, one the size of an orange and one the size of a grape. The first surgery, he had a 2% chance of survival while they tried, attempted to remove the largest tumor. He said to my mom what she thought would be his dying words, and he told her to tell me, Tori, a fake cough, that she is the weirdest girl that I have ever met. <laughs> when my mom told me, I thought it was pretty funny. I bet in the moment she did not, but he did survive his surgery. When I got to the hospital, he was out of surgery. Uh, I got to the room, he was still sleepy. And I walked in and what I saw was not my little brother. His head was shaved. He had stitches down his skull that echoed a seam of a baseball. And he had tubes hooked up to him. It was really frightening. I saw him again three days later and he was three days into his treatment, post-diagnosis, and he was three surgeries into his treatment. I walked into the room and he didn't respond, um, which I came to find out is because he had lost his sight. I didn't know that going into the room. I was 11 years old at the time, not the most important person to update, but it still hurt that I didn't know this important news about my brother. The next time I saw him, he was four surgeries in and in the ICU. Me and my mom were talking with him when his eyes started to swell up big and black. Realistically, it was probably the size of a golf ball, but at the time it felt like a softball, just kept getting bigger and bigger. So we called the nurse in and they rushed him out to his fifth brain surgery. The next time I saw him was eight days after his diagnosis and he was six brain surgeries into his treatment. He had a central line in for easy access to his veins. He had an NG tube in for easy access to feeding. He was starting his year and a half long journey of chemotherapy and beginning his six weeks of radiation. Everyone was saying what a miracle it was that he had survived his surgeries, that he had survived long enough to start his treatment, which to me at the time felt very premature. We were eight days into this. And not only that, it felt um, insincere, it felt wrong. My little brother wasn't my little brother anymore. It didn't feel like my brother had survived. To reiterate this, the doctors called him Paul. That was his full name. It was what was on his hospital band. It was what was on the whiteboard in his hospital room. And so it's just the name that stuck. So everyone called PJ Paul. So quite literally, PJ was nowhere to be found. I was angry, and I remember feeling at the situation, angry that Paul was sick, angry that PJ was gone, and feeling angry with Paul himself for this. 
I felt jealous of the attention he was getting from my single mom who had to stop the bleeding. She's only one person and had to stay at the hospital with him most days. I felt bitter that he couldn't play with me the way that he had before. And it all came to a head when someone had offered me a special surprise and I, I really wanted these fruit snacks. Um, they were a rarity in our house. They were expensive and something that I didn't get often. And I ended up getting in trouble for asking because if there was extra resources, they were to go to Paul. And in that moment, I felt so angry and I had to decide whether I was going to be bitter, blame Paul for this awful situation that he too didn't want to be in, or if I was going to choose to accept what was going on and accept my new brother, Paul. So I decided to shave my head. I was in fifth grade at the time, so I hadn't yet hit puberty. I got mistaken for a boy often, so it was a sacrifice, but I remember going into Paul's room and I didn't tell him that I had shaved my head, I just let him feel my head. And he was so excited that we got to be bald buddies. <laughs> he didn't know how he looked bald, so he was incredibly self-conscious about it, and it really meant a lot to him that he had someone else to share this experience with. I also started learning Braille. We didn't know if Paul would survive long enough to need to learn Braille, but I knew if, I, if he did, I wanted to be in a position to be able to help him learn Braille. I got online and I Googled the alphabet and the numbers. I connected with some of Paul's friends that he had met as a support group that were also visually impaired. And I started learning Braille. I started volunteering with local organizations that provided sp sports for those who are visually impaired. Um, eventually I got to referee in the 2012 Paralympic USA qualifiers. Um, it was something that I stuck with for a long time, and eventually when Paul was feeling better, something that we did together. All this time I was putting in this effort trying to connect with Paul, but he was so sick that he wasn't able to reciprocate. So I didn't know if he wanted to be my friend still. It wasn't until, ironically, he had a poor reaction to one of his medications and started hallucinating and having a two-hour long conversation with me, quote unquote, that I realized that maybe in there he still wanted to be my friend. When my mom told me, we both laughed together, but it really made me think maybe he does still want to talk. Maybe he does still want to be my friend. Even though I couldn't see a relationship with my brother clearly, Paul obviously had a vision of what we could be, talking like pals. We had to be creative in the ways that we played together. He was hooked up to machines, couldn't see our favorite shows, and so we tried to do things that were tactual together, something that we could touch. I remember a rarity when he was home for a weekend, it was snowing and he was sad he couldn't go outside and play in the snow. So I brought some snow in and we had a snowball fight in his room and luckily he didn't catch a cold or else my mom would have killed me. But <laughs> he's, he, we had a lot of fun and it was the first time that things felt like old times. Paul's 24 now and healthy. He's an inspiration to many, including myself. I work in Braille services now and every day get to serve students that are visually impaired and offer them equitable services so they can take tests and their classes and receive materials in Braille. Something that really stuck out to me though was how much we enjoyed art. We've always enjoyed art and I really wanted to find a way to continue that love together. And so for years I tried different things. I, I did an art show where I coordinated the colors to sound waves and you could listen to the sound of the painting that you were looking at, but I didn't put the recording in. So I just said like, oh, it's in the key of C. And Paul's like, that's great. And I was like, oh, that didn't work. So scratch that idea. <laughs> so I tried these different things, trying to incorporate touch or sound into my art. And finally I landed on tactile art made of fibers. So I'm an artist for the blind and visually impaired. I create art that you can touch and see. I recently had an exhibition in Houston, Texas where um, it was centered around my little brother and I's love for 
Pokemon. <laughs> um, I made one tapestry, four foot by six foot, out of yarn, a clear picture of Ash Ketchum and Pikachu. And then I made some goggles that simulated my brother's sight. And I looked at the tapestry and I started to design things that looked the way that Paul saw them. I wanted the world to see through Paul's eyes because Paul has such a beautiful vision of the world. I created two more tapestries with holes, with blurried, with blurried pictures, primarily black and blue. He can see 2,800 out of the left quadrant of his left eye, and the rest is shapes and shadows, darks and lights. When Paul flew out to see the show, I remember him feeling it, walking around each one, being very quiet, and then just starting to jump up and down, so excited that he got to be a part of the art world and that we got to share art together again. Something that I'm very passionate about and I got to share with many of my friends that I work with, also with visual impairment. I got to share it with many sighted individuals as well who got to view through Paul's eyes the world that he sees, his favorite thing that he can see, which is his favorite show, Pikachu and Ash Pokemon. And it really just taught me that when we love someone and we see them changing, our love needs to grow and evolve with that person. And if it doesn't, we can miss out on a best friend because me and Paul are best friends. Thank you. A photo. Tori standing next to three very large, colorful, and highly textured pieces of art, fiber assemblages hanging from the tall ceiling of a large room. A photo, Tori's large, colorful yarn and cloth assemblage artwork being touched by a person who has impaired vision, Tori standing to the side. A photo, Tori standing with her brother as he touches one of Tori's mixed media assemblages, artwork that's green, blue, red, white, yellow loops, felt balls, long yarn tassels, and many other textures. Thank you, Tori. All right, bring us the slammer dunk thing there, and um, we can also fade out the projector when you have a chance, and we're gonna get some slammer stories to close out our evening. Here comes Susan. Next up is one of our story subscribers. I don't know if she's told a story before. Darcy Valverde. <laughs> Her husband told a story at late night for I think it was, uh, am I supposed to be grateful for this just a couple of months ago? So maybe this is a internal family challenge. Is this your first time telling a story? I thought it was. All right, well, you know how it works. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Jody. Oh, I'm really nervous. Jody came up with the box, and I was like, no, Jody, no, 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 no. Very nervous. Um, but he actually uh, introduced me as something I wanted to start off with, as my husband and I, this is such a community to us in Boise, and probably to many of you here, I hope. So if you haven't had a chance, <laughs> We're subscribers, there's that, and there's also the whole like texting 44321 SSN 2022. Looks like we were not quite halfway to the goal, so throw that out there. Um, anyway, for me, I mean, the last couple storytellers, wow, so amazing. Tori, uh, whoa, uh, I'm here now, and my story 
is kind of the opposite. I think it's, it's so beautiful the way that you've been able to share sight with people who, with their eyes, physically, it's, it's just a different experience, right? And that's so beautiful, I love it. And for me, my, my story is more about, uh, I'm very extroverted, historically speaking in my life, very extroverted. Uh, I feed off of other people, I like to be around people, the energy, I talk, 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 talk. And I'm also a yogi, and I love the practice of yoga. And one of the pieces of yoga that I found when I moved to Boise, actually, before Boise, I was all into like the hot yoga. I was like, yeah, I need that yoga booty, right? And, like we just like hot yoga, yeah, vinyasa, flow, 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 push up, push up, push up. And then I found this amazing community of sage yoga, uh, Marissa Wepner. Marissa Rado Wepner had this amazing space called Sage Yoga. Oh gosh, I get teary thinking about it because COVID closed the doors. But in Sage Yoga, I found this amazing community much like Story Story Night. And also, one of my favorite teachers who's become a very dear friend of mine introduced me to the practice of Yoga Nidra. Nidra in Sanskrit translates to sleep for us in English. So it's this practice of, for me, going from the go, 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 vinyasa, flow, push up, push up, push up, hot yoga, to like yoga nidra as the practice of yogic sleep or the practice of non-doing. So I'm going to invite you for just a moment, if you feel safe and comfortable doing it, allow your eye gaze to soften or maybe even closing your eyes completely. Yoga Nidra allowed me to tap into the center of who my soul is, right? So like removing the sight completely, allowing the darkness to settle in, noticing the sounds coming through the ears, feeling the ears receiving sound in the eardrums. Feeling the ear canal opening up and receiving sound. How does that feel without the vision? Allowing the skin to open to the feeling of the air on the skin, the temperature, hot, cold, feeling the fabric of the clothes touching the skin. Feeling that on your flesh, how does that feel? Allowing the nostrils to open and receive the smells, the scents of all that is in this room, in this space with us tonight. Taking that in. Feeling the air moving, the hair in the nostrils. Allowing all the senses. I was so excited when I heard about the theme of the season of Story Story Night. Open all the senses to receive everything that is here in this space. Be here now, in this moment. And sometimes, as you work into a meditative practice, as I still try myself to do, it's, it's not easy but closing the eyes and just looking within, opening the other senses, the sound, the smell, the feel, being in the moment and just allowing your body to soak it all in. It allows us to be more present. For me, it made me realize moving from the hot yoga, wanting to get a hot ass, <laughs> doing the hot yoga, doing all the vinyasa flows, to just realizing what really matters is where we are in this moment, right here. Settling down, slowing down, being in the moment, opening all of the senses to what is here and what is now. And Story Story Night is quite the place to do that. And that is my story of feeling more in the moment rather than finding, looking for the end result of a hot ass just being in the moment where Jody is kicking me off the stage right now as we speak. 
just feel it, be in it, soak it up, love it, and subscribe to Story Story Night or donate 44321 SSN 2022. Do you go and sign the oh, Of course I will. Do I yeah, you can oh. have it. That's yours. Oh, it matches you. your husband's, I think. No, he has a late night one. Uh, yeah, I forgot to tell you all slammers to go over there with your parental units when appropriate and sign our release form. Uh, I told a hot yoga story last month, so I can't use that as a segue, although I have a feeling that Darcy is a better yoga teacher than I had in Brooklyn. I remember one time this Brooklyn yogi said, your name is Jody, right? And I said, yes, yes, my name's Jody. And she says, okay, because I told you to put your arms behind your ears and you did not do it. <laughs> and for the record, I cannot. Like in swim class, uh, everyone was using the kickboard behind their head. They all made it look so easy. And I was going down the pool drowning because <laughs> my, my arms won't go behind my ears, guys. And so my kickboard is up here and my head is under the water. Well, I didn't, I wasn't long for swim class anyway. Uh, let's bring up another slammer. You guys are busy over there. No, Susan's ready. She's got it going. All right. I haven't done any hot yoga in Boise. Hot yoga in Brooklyn was pretty intense. One of our other yogis was a firefighter and 30 minutes into the class, you could smell smoke in the room. Tune with your senses. Thank you. I feel like I've read this last name tonight before, but maybe this, this <laughs> unless she's disguising her name, now it says E.B. Kaufner. The E.B. is that, that's a different person, right? It's not this, it's not, oh, okay, there are two people coming up. <laughs> this, are there two people coming up on stage? Just one. No, okay, you're just escorting her and make sure she makes it here, okay? All right. Are you responsible for that bundle of energy that's... No, you're not. No. Oh, okay. But I love her. She's well, we all love her. Yeah. I had to bring up water because I told her I was... I had a fear of public speaking and she couldn't understand... No. ...why you would need... why your she mouth would get... Yeah, she has no fear. No fear. No, no fear. fear. <laughs> um, I've actually seen a couple people in here that know this story. Um, I'm, I'm going to zigzag around a little bit, but I will bring it back to sight. Um, so I have a very type A personality. I like to be in control of my life. I like to know exactly what's going on. So rewind 10 years, almost to the day. Um, my husband and I are, we are pregnant and we have this, uh, well, first of all, I've had two miscarriages trying to get pregnant. Finally, this baby has stuck. And I'm still type A, want to be in control. My husband and I are arguing over, do we find out the sex of the baby, do we not? I went out, and so we go to, we file into the ultrasound, and we all look away, and she sees the sex of the baby, puts it into an envelope, seals it. I immediately, Hand, hand, I call my girlfriend who lives in Seattle, who is going to bake us a cake. I have talked a friend in who happens to be traveling from Seattle to Boise to pack this cake, bring it to me, and we're going to have a gender reveal. So the, I have my friend on the phone. The ultrasound tech takes the phone, goes out of the room, tells my friend this is what it's going to be. We. Fast forward the next, the next day, the cake is here, we have this party. Now, we, before the party, my husband and I are laying in bed and I ask him, I said, what do you hope this is? Because I wanted a girl. And he says, I hope it's a girl. I, I just, I want her to call me Papa. And so we have these, we sit here for actually a couple nights dreaming about what this girl would be like. So we have this party. We cut the cake and pink spills out everywhere. And we are so excited. We name her, her name was Emily Simone. And so, I mean, then we spend, my husband, he is a videographer and so he has lots of equipment and 
he would put it up to my belly and we have her heartbeat and and we so we just dreamed about our life with this little girl so fast forward i had gone oh so first grandchild in the family first child four baby showers we travel to portland we have baby showers here my high school friends have a baby shower my college friends have a baby shower for us so we have just pink everywhere we design the baby the room everything i am i've decided that i want to paint the house a month before i'm due so i go around i buy all this paint and i'm just putting paint swatches up on all the walls and my husband just very graciously rolls his eyes like yep we'll get this painted so i decide i don't want to sleep in the house while we're painting so we go to my parents house and four and a half weeks early before i go to i'm due i get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and i lay back down in bed and i can't tell for you ladies that have experienced this i can't tell if my water has broke or if i've just totally lost control of my bladder so i immediately go wake up my husband and I say I think my water broke and oh and I should say we were supposed to be <clears throat> at the with the midwives at the birth center but in Idaho at that time you couldn't deliver it outside of the hospital if you were 30 I think it was 37 weeks or before so I go upstairs run and grab my mom and dad so everybody is just jacked up we're all excited about baby Emily Simone uh, she's coming so I call my midwife, she has me come into the, to the clinic and she swabs me and, uh, yep, it's amniotic fluid, you, your water has broke, I am not in labor. So she says, go home, have as much food as you can eat because once you're there, they're going to make you deliver. So I go home and I, we eat as much as we can and we're just the whole time talking about this Emily Simone. And I get to the hospital and they, of course, induce me. And so my midwife is there. I now have an OB there. I've got, because he's so, or she's so early, all of the NICU people are down there. Uh, my mom's there. My dad chose not to be there, but he's waiting by the phone, did not have a cell phone at that time, waiting by the phone for, for the, the news to come to the hospital. So I deliver this sweet little baby girl and my, I can hear my mom on the phone call my dad and say, come meet baby Simone. She's here. She's beautiful. And you also have to know, my dad had girls, so we've never had boys in our, in our lives. So uh, immediately, they take the baby, and they put her on my chest and cover her up. And I'm telling you, there were at least 15 people in this room, all healthcare professionals. Nobody, because we've been talking about Emily Simone. Mm -hmm. I have my hand underneath the blanket, <laughs> and I think, man, I've heard of it being swollen. <laughs> I think she's got some extra parts. Like, I think she might have a tumor or something. Like, <laughs> this is all running through my head. And now everybody's, they're, they're stopped looking at me. They're all walking around the room, and I lift up the blanket, and I put it down. And I said, just so you all know, this is an effing boy. <laughs> and the whole room explodes in laughter. And at that moment, my dad walks in, and my husband meets him at the door and says, come in and meet your grandson. And my dad says, grandson? And he says, yeah, you have a grandson. And he just immediately started crying. But I will say, it was a lesson that, you know, kids teach us that you have no control over anything. <laughs> and I now actually have not one boy, but two boys. <laughs> and they help me see the world in a, in a way that I would have never seen it otherwise. So. <laughs> Elise, make sure she fills that form correctly. All right. All right, let's bring down that screen one last time to check in on our end of year giving campaign. Remember, we do have until December 31st. If you didn't feel like texting tonight, you can go to our website. And, um, you know, last, so 
this time went by so fast, and it reminds me that last month when I do the closing thank yous, and there's a little song there that we had put together in the, in the spirit of Carol Burnett and how she would end her show, I'm so glad we had this time together. Um, which I got to hear her sing at the Morrison Center not too many months ago. That was pretty cool. Uh, but last month when I did this, uh, I looked over and there was a teenager over here who clearly thought it was one of the cheesiest things he had ever heard in his life. Uh, okay, yeah, it is a little corny, a little cheesy for sure. And uh, it reminded me of my co first uh, college roommate who said to me, you know, coming from Boise, Idaho and moving to Portland, which at that time was the big city, and he said, you know, at first I thought you were just super fake, like really cheerful and happy and nice and super fake, and then I realized that that was really you. <laughs> and it's kind of, oh, wow, you guys, you did it. You blew it out of the, oh, there it is. <laughs> All right, I think we're, uh, we've got some new ones up there again. Uh, Chong V and Andrea and Michelle, thank you. Uh, that's two zero two two four four three two one. All right, let's start that theme song music, and I'll treat you all to the cheesy, inauthentic me in just a moment. Stories come from the land as well as its people, and I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Shoshone Bannock people. Story Story Night is supported by public funding for the arts through the Idaho Commission on the Arts, the Idaho Legislature, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you to all of you here who texted SSN 2022 to 44321. You have until December 31st to participate, and you can also go later to storystorynight.org and click the end of the year giving $5,000 match button on our homepage to give on your computer. Remember, you can listen to podcasts from all our shows or see the flagship show on our YouTube channel at Story Story Boise. We also have a radio show. It's Story Story Night on Stray Theater, which you can hear on the Sunday before our live show from 5.30 to 6 p.m. on Radio Boise. Thank you to our crew, technical director, podcast, and video engineer, Stephen Baldessari, right back there. Thank you to Irreverent Tones. Thank you to our photographer, Christina Birkenbein. Thank you to our volunteers and our volunteer coordinator, Natalia DiGosia. Thank you to our board of directors and Nathan, who is out there manning our box office tonight. Thank you to our story subscribers. And also, I think, story, story night. Story, story, good night. Beginning, middle, now, at the end. Authentic, inspiring, spontaneous. So thank you. You shared your stories and you really listened. This is the party laughed at. I might have come here as a stranger, but now I'm leaving as a friend. But it's me, I mean it, I mean it. And that's why we keep coming back because and so the stories never end. Thank you to Jump for hosting us. Join us here on January 31st for hearing. Tickets will be available tomorrow. So great to see all of you. Good night.